Hi there, uh, good afternoon um, or good morning, wherever you're listening from. Um, my name's Mike Smith. Um, I'm a smart manufacturing consultant for ATS in the UK. Um, I've been working in and around manufacturing um, for the last 20 years, um, from PLCs to SCADA through to uh, IoT systems, MES systems, uh, Industry 4 and, and integrating all of those systems. Um, and low code is, is something that's kind of come up on my radar in the last uh, year or so. Um, so I just thought it'd be good to have this webinar to um, kind of look into what low code is um, at a high level. So we'll we'll spend about 15, 20 minutes to, to run through this and then have some Q&A at the end. Um, so if you have any questions, um, yeah, do drop them in the chat um, and we'll get to them as we, we go along. So we're going to look at what low code is, how does it benefit me, uh, what do I use it for, and how can ATS help? Um, so just starting off at a high level really, um, trying to understand those basic concepts around it so that you can understand it better, um, see how you could use it in your business to help you drive forward your digital journey, um, hopefully at an accelerated rate um, in ways that you hadn't thought of yet. Um, I think it's it's a topic that gets banded around a lot, low code, and there's lots of buzzwords. Um, so hopefully we can we can dig a little bit deeper and understand what those buzzwords mean. So this slide, here's a few of those buzzwords. Um, so so what is low code? Um, well, it fits between uh, high code or traditional code or kind of full stack development on the left there and no code on the right. Um, so low code kind of fits uh, in the middle and, and often kind of low code and no code platforms get grouped together as low no code platforms. Um, so let's start at the left then. So high code, um, full stack development. So that's um, examples of that would be things like VB, uh, C Sharp, .NET, um, Java, so a completely open development framework um, that can be fully custom. Um, it's got traditional development cycles. So traditionally, we'll see that in Waterfall or, or moving now towards um, agile development. Uh, we've got full stack developers. So uh, it, it takes a lot of training to be able to develop capabilities within high code. Um, well, maybe not a lot of training to do it, but a lot of training to do it well and appropriately. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of your full stack developers, your traditional IT developers. Um, you've got custom user interfaces, so everything you do um, it can be completely customized. Um, you tend to start from scratch and you will develop um, those interfaces as you see fit. Um, user experience designers, so yeah, often that's kind of a full time job, um, depending on the level of development that a company does. Um, is having that, um, that user experience development, that front end to make it user friendly. Um, often the developers are good at developing code, um, not necessarily at making it look and feel um, intuitive and usable. So often those kind of two skill sets work together. Um, and then custom connectors at the bottom. Um, so um, there might be some standard libraries, um, but predominantly um, it will use standard protocols such as kind of REST APIs, XML, web services, um, but the, how those are implemented um, will be completely up to the developers as to how that goes. Um, comparing that with uh, yeah, low code, let's go there next. So it's customizable. It's more of kind of a, a toolbox platform than uh, a traditional development is. Um, so you'll have an object which you will then customize to your needs versus the fully custom um, of full stack development. Um, citizen developers, this is kind of a new term that's being banded around since the uh, creation of low code. So citizen developers, the idea is that um, you can then enable anyone who's interested or, or your entire workforce um, and bring them into that code development cycle. 
Um, so when, when someone asks for a piece of functionality, you can get them involved in the development process. Um, because they're, they're capable of doing it in these low code, no code platforms, um, whereas traditionally um, the end user would give create some requirements possibly. Um, that would then go into the IT department who would then create um, a, a platform or an application. It would then get delivered back to the user uh, for some kind of acceptance testing. But with low code and no code, you can get those um, the people that are creating those requirements to get involved, to, to be part of that development cycle and to feedback um, on that application as it goes. Um, rapid application development. This is probably one of the, the key um, cornerstones of low code and, and no code platforms that they're quick because they're templated, um, because you're kind of bringing together pre-built blocks, um, configuring them, sequencing them together in flows, you can, you can generate something very quickly. And that's one of the key kind of selling points of these technologies. Uh, collaborative development. So these platforms have been developed from the ground up for collaboration in mind. Um, so you can work um, with large teams and it handles that um, the different approach, different users working on it at the same time. Uh, customizable templates. I think we've, we've probably covered that, but you've got these kind of building blocks that you can then uh, tweak and customize as you need. Uh, what you see is what you get, so WYSIWYG um, designed to your needs. So these platforms are much more kind of visual in their design language, um, much more um, drag and drop and, and pulling these things together. So as you design it, you get to see how it, it turns out compared to the traditional kind of full stack development um, where you would create something and then, then run it or simulate it to see how it feels. Um, you've got templates, so loads of templates, massive libraries of these kind of pre-built functionalities, a bit like the libraries that you have in the traditional full stack development, um, but much kind of wider, more industry specific, or you could start to develop your own templates, um, put them on your own kind of marketplace and things like that. Uh, and pre-built connectors, so you've got lots of connectors that are based around the applications and where they might be used. So in terms of what we're looking at, manufacturing, um, you can have connectors to many of the big kind of ERP, MES systems, things like that would be out of the box and you can just plug them in and you've already got that functionality um, straight into your solution. And then over to the right, uh, no code. So I guess the difference between uh, high code, low code, and no code. High code will be pure development. Low code is kind of no code, but with some elements that you can then add those higher level languages. So perhaps like a, there'll be some areas where you could put some Java code in. And then no code will just be purely kind of, um, yeah, drag and drop, pulling these building blocks together, tying them together. Um, so the skill level is kind of, yeah, much easier to access in, in the no code world, but it'll be less customizable. Um, still engaging the citizen development, still having that rap rapid application development um, and very much has a templated look and feel um, because of, um, yeah, because of the fact that you're just dragging and drop these systems into it. So just moving on now. So all of these features basically bring, yeah, so we're focusing on low code. So this is a new approach to application development. Um, the big win being that it speeds up development cycles by simplifying the process of creating functionality. Um, and one of, the, one of the issues that we see time and time again is that um, people want functionality and, and the IT department or the development cycle is just taking too long. Um, so often that functionality will get created um, I, in, I guess kind of previous low code type platforms, things like Excel, people will, will go to town on Excel, creating macros and, and customizing it. Um, so this could give them some kind of capabilities to do that in a more controlled and, uh, and meaningful way, really. So how does it benefit me? Well, we've got all these benefits listed here. So speed of development and change. So um, because of the way that they're built together, um, we can really create some platforms, some applications, some functionality um, very quickly in a low code platform and get it deployed out to the shop floor. 
um, which isn't something we're used to um, in the manufacturing domain. Um, often these kind of systems are big, heavy systems that take a long, long time to deliver, years of planning, requirements gathering. Um, but really, we, we can start to, to leverage these low code platforms in manufacturing to deliver something very much, yeah, quite quickly onto the shop floor. Um, and also the speed of change. So although we can deliver it quickly, um, it's then not hard to tweak and, and enhance those systems as we get there. Uh, speed of deployment, so yep, getting those systems deployed. A lot of um, low-code systems are kind of cloud-based, um, or at least with that architecture, that future forward-looking architecture in mind. Um, so we can really rapidly deploy them onto the shop floor. Easy integration to other systems. So like I said, you've got these pre-built connectors, these standardized interfaces, um, and you can just start to plug in those other systems um, and build that logic up in your application to use that information. Uh, engagement of end users, uh, I think to me, this is one of the, the key ones really, um, because a lot of the problems of deploying a system on the shop floor is getting the end users to buy into that system um, to really deliver that cultural change. Um, and with low code, that's kind of built in um, to the application. So you can send live feedback. You can get those end users engaged in the development cycle. Um, you can get them yeah, creating the look and feel of it, adding comments, um, giving you live feedback. So really, um, with your end users giving you feedback and that speed of development and change, um, it really kind of engages people that are using it and gives them some kind of ownership of the application. It makes them much more um, happy to kind of use it and, and move forward with it. Uh, increased development team. So no longer are you kind of stuck with your IT department, but you can open up the development cycle um, to uh, the full development team. So you're opening it up to those end users, um, all those citizen developers that you might have, people that have got good ideas. Um, you can get those ideas and you can get them working on developing those ideas into a solution. Um, one that's in a centrally managed tool and not something like Excel. Multi-platform support, so you can deploy it across um, multi-platforms, so laptops, uh, tablets, mobile devices. Um, yeah, they're, they're kind of based around these architectures and it's really a quick way to do it. You don't need to redevelop um, if you want a mobile application versus something that's, that's on your tablet or laptop. The low cost of development, so going with the speed, the, the cost of it is also um, they're much cheaper to kind of scale out. They're not this kind of big, heavy, uh, large overhead license um, that we're used to. And multi-domain templates. So um, most of these low-code tools have, will have libraries of templates or, or an online marketplace, a bit like your kind of app store. Um, and they've got templates that are pre-built around a lot of the common use cases that you'll come across. Um, and then as you kind of move forward in your development cycle, um, you can then create your own templates within your own business, um, or you can get system integrators to do that. This is kind of a yeah, high level run through of those benefits. So what do I use it for? Um, and I think this is kind of one of the hard ones, uh, one of the hard questions to answer with low code because um, a lot of the providers will say, well, it, it can do anything and it can do everything. Um, so so what, what are its boundaries? Well, I think within in the manufacturing world, this kind of um, post layered architecture model that, that Gartner had developed um, really adds some kind of clarity. So they've divided, um, you've got systems of records, systems of differentiation and systems of innovation. Um, so the idea is that a system of record will have uh, very detailed, defined requirements, and it, it doesn't change very much. So that's kind of your, your core business system. So that will be things like uh, your ERP, MES, PLM systems, um, core business systems that are the same basic functionality across many different businesses. Systems of differentiation, so that will be systems and um, potentially best of breed applications that could be um, that would fit with your company's specific needs or systems that would um, 
that would be tailored specifically for how your business is differentiated on the market from different areas. And then we've got systems of innovation. So that the rate of change within systems of innovation is very high. They don't have very defined requirements. Um, you're trying things out. You're adding new capabilities. Um, the rate of change is very quick. So they're kind of, they're, they're moving in, they're changing, they're adapting, they're moving out. They're not huge investments, but it's just kind of rapid development to try something out. So what these systems would look like. So like I said, systems of record, you've got the ERP, PLM, there's um, warehouse management systems. Systems of differentiation, they might be more aligned to your business. So things like SCADA, IoT systems, and then systems of innovation, ad hoc systems. I keep going back to it, but often we see these in Excel. Um, people might develop it in kind of C -sharp .net, um, BB, depending on their skill sets. Often these are kind of start to form the shadow IT, which then uh, starts as a system of innovation, but then moves into the systems of differentiation and you get the issues of support and things like that that move on with it. So, yeah, so where can low code be applied? Well, it can be applied to all of these levels. Um, so systems of record, um, you've got the kind of extension application. So all of these systems, you, you could keep a system of record or, or differentiation or innovation as they were, um, but you could extend their functionality and their capabilities within a low code environment. Um, so one of the use cases that I see is quite strong is having a, an MES system, a manufacturing execution system. Um, but you can, if you need to tweak that to your particular needs or add some enhancements to it, um, you could keep that core system completely out of the box to enable your, your easy upgrades. Um, but then you could extend that functionality in a low code system using those standard interfaces. Um, to add that functionality that you need to make it, I don't know, more user friendly, more customized um, to link into your specific tools and systems. Um, so you could use low code to do that. Um, you could also deploy it as a platform. Um, if your requirements for a system of record are not too kind of heavyweight, um, I think that's probably then a low code system. You could create something um, in there that would meet your needs. And would probably link into a higher level system of record. Um, so I guess, yeah, you could look at a system and you could kind of um, go out onto the market and you kind of look at what they would deliver and you would only really utilize maybe 10, 15% of the functionality that you're paying for. In that instance, you could, uh, you could create that system within a low code platform. Um, systems of differentiation. So um, again, you could develop that in a, in a low code platform, um, which is great because it has the capability to really customize and, and, and tweak it for your needs. Um, and then a kind of one of the bigger plays as well is the system of innovation. So capturing all of that shadow IT, those things where people want to try things out. Um, you've then got a platform where you can create applications, you can extend its functionality, um, and you can really kind of create some capabilities quite quickly um, that enable people to, to innovate. Um, they're not waiting um, for this kind of application to be developed by IT and then deployed to the shop floor, but they can get involved defining those requirements, engaging with those systems uh, and getting something really innovative stood up in a quick space of time. And again, that can be extended to link in um, on the left hand side to all of those different systems. Um, I think one word of caution I would say is that I wouldn't create everything inside a low code platform. Um, although you could, if there's something off the shelf um, that is supportable, that is standardized, that is, is built around your business and fits your need, then I wouldn't reinvent the wheel. I would use that system and potentially use a low code system to extend it, customize it, tweak it. Um, for what you need. And I think that way you, you kind of get the best of both worlds. Which I think probably, yeah, rolls on quite nicely to how ATS can help. Well, yeah, so ATS can provide domain experience, um, expertise in manufacturing, 
um, flexible templated solutions, global support, scoping guidance and extension development. Um, so we could develop something in a low code platform for you. Um, we could support that. I think one of the, the core things is our domain expertise and scoping guidance. So falling back to that previous um, slide, helping you to understand um, when we should be looking into an off the shelf system, what off the shelf systems are available uh, or what you should be deploying in a low code platform. Um, and then offering that guidance, support, training, um, and getting you kind of up to speed um, on that low code development. And this is kind of linked to our best practice approaches um, and industrial experience. So, yeah, we've been in the manufacturing space for, for 30 plus years, um, engaging with these off the shelf, more traditional systems, and, and now moving into the low code space and understanding how that fits within them. And, and standards like ISO 95, so the definition of kind of uh, manufacturing, all those different layers and activities and, and the functionalities and capabilities that are needed and required by manufacturing. Um, yeah, we can advise and guide and, and help you kind of understand where best to get that um, benefit out of low code. So, yeah. That's low code at a very high level and a quick kind of run through. Hopefully that's been uh, helpful and informative. Um, if you've got any questions, yeah, now's a, a good time, Olga, if we've got any. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Yes, we have a few questions. Question number one, can or should I replace my existing software with low code? Okay, yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, replacing your existing software with low code, um, I think it, it depends on how old is that software, is it, is it still in support? Um, I guess I probably wouldn't use that as a starting point um, for deploying a low code system unless it was something that was going end of life or out of support. Um, certainly wouldn't just kind of yeah rip up the existing infrastructure and and deploy a low code system because it's uh, it's a new technology and it's attractive um but probably start off with something a bit smaller something that's kind of um really going to deliver business value and be quite easy to implement um understand how those low code platforms uh, work and fit and how you can develop them and then I would I would grow that within your business potentially migrating um, those existing solutions into it as as they kind of need customizations or changes um, to fit your business needs okay thank you another question what should I not you be what should I not be using low code for okay yeah so uh, I guess I've probably spoken about it a bit already, but what should you not be using low code for is um, building, I would say kind of building these big systems when there's there's something that meets your need and is off the shelf. Um, I think if you, yeah, if your business kind of is, is quite a standardized um, structured business, uh, and there's software solutions and platforms that deliver that functionality off the shelf, um why reinvent the wheel why not just use that um but it's those customizations that you could then start to bring in the low code uh, to keep those systems out the box um or if your yeah if your requirements aren't that heavy um then absolutely you you could bring in low code um but i think yeah i think that's probably where the domain expertise comes in to understand your business um to understand the requirements and the capabilities that you have uh, and see what systems are out there and how low code can be used to complement those systems okay thank you and we have one more question why would i resort to low code if i have enough competent full stack developers yeah okay so yeah so why do you need a low code solution when you could just do everything in, in full stack code um and i think to me one of the, the big drivers for low code is kind of engaging those citizen developers and although you may have enough um you can always do more 
if you have a, a bigger um, citizen developer workforce. And also that low code will also enable your full stack developers um, to focus on that full stack development and not spend a lot of kind of highly skilled, highly paid resources to develop um, the connectors and the look and feel and all of the kind of more straightforward stuff that maybe the citizen developers could get involved in. It would then free up those full stack developers to kind of focus on those customizations and those those full code aspects um, within the low code environments. So I think really it would, yeah, it would enable those skilled resources to, to focus on the skilled work um, and also get the engagement from other people um, within the business and, and start to get that cultural change and, and rapid buy-in and adoption of these um, applications and the benefits they can deliver on the shop floor. All right. And the one more question has just arrived. I guess there are different local structures. Which one do you think is the best to use? Local structures. Um, yeah, is there any kind of clarification on what you mean by structures? Well, and the question is from paper, so maybe we can um, get it uh, offline and uh, reach out. Uh, yeah. To April well, after this session. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the the structures because there's different. Yeah, lots of different kind of low code uh, platforms out there. Um, and I would say really it's about understanding your needs, um, understanding kind of what domain you're working in, as to which one of those low code platforms um, would would deliver within your particular kind of industry and domain. Um, they all kind of have their strengths and weaknesses. So it's finding yeah, a platform that aligns its strengths um, with what you need as a business. I'd say that's the best approach in terms of finding a loco platform, if, if that was <laughs> the question. Okay, so I think you answer it very well. And I don't see any other new questions coming. So thank you, Mike. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, so if, yeah, if there are any further questions or you want to get in touch, um, my contact details are yeah on the screen now. So yeah, thank you for your time this afternoon, and uh, hopefully I'll I'll be in touch with you later. Thank you very much for everyone for attending this event.